The gallery's creation was quite accidental. Its embryonic stage vulnerable and under constant attack. Its establishment unique in Canada. Art galleries are often associated with a highbrow or even snobbish attitude. That is to say, for the average person, art galleries can be very intimidating. Many individuals may feel uncomfortable entering an art gallery because they believe that if one does not have a degree in fine art or is not a professional artist, then they are not welcome. To be fair, there are many galleries where the average person may feel unwelcome. This is not the case at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. The RMG was not a top-down organization created only for those with an extensive art background and education. Its mandate, right from the beginning, was to create a place to display important works of Canadian art created by well-known and local artists and to make these displays approachable at all levels of appreciation and understanding. Indeed, the story behind the creation and ever-expanding development of the Robert McLaughlin Gallery is one that models well exactly how one man's idea can evolve into a world-class organization. In February of 1967, William Caldwell attended an art show featuring local artists in the basement of the McLaughlin Public Library. Bill decided to appreciate one particular piece of art by Catherine Christie from a more distant viewpoint. As he backed away from the piece, he accidentally tripped over a chair. Bill considered this to be an affront of insensitive indifference to much effort and commitment by those persons whose works were on display. This troublesome event could either be casually dismissed or addressed. Bill decided to address the issue. Within the next few days, he instructed his secretary to locate and contact every person listed upon the program of participants provided by the McLaughlin Library and invite all to meet on the evening of the 23rd of February at Mrs. Caldwell's residence. At this gathering of citizens who shared Caldwell's vision for establishing a permanent gallery, he acquired a commitment of funds to start the process. Here it was recommended that each set down a sum each could afford per month. This would be the seed money to finance the first significant art gallery in Oshawa. This group became known as the Founders. As it transpired, these founders would in part include carpenter, laborer, housewife, merchant, school teacher, bank teller, doctor, and factory worker. Truly a grassroots organization. Now that an organization and a financial structure have been created, a suitable location for the new gallery needed to be found. By the latter part of February 1967, Caldwell, with the assistance of Brian Mudd, one of the original group of founders, scouted the downtown section of the city of Oshawa looking for a site. They finally decided upon the upstairs section of a business at 7 1⁄2 Simcoe Street North. The owner of the building, Mr. Murray Johnson, graciously supported the project by offering the site rent-free for the first two months of occupation. In the next three and a half months, just 112 days, a complete metamorphosis of the site would take place. As Jean-Paul Morset, the Director of Extension Services of the National Gallery of Canada would state at the official opening of the Oshawa Art Gallery, it is the belief of the National Gallery of Canada that this is a unique accomplishment in Canada where a public gallery has been established entirely from the grassroots. Caldwell reports that within minutes of that pronouncement, the galleries offered a quarter of a million dollars for a new building. It was also requested that the gallery change its name to read the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. The check was graciously received, the name change assured. The Oshawa Art Gallery now had a formally structured organization. 31 people, primarily art-oriented, pioneered the creation of the gallery. However, not everyone was supportive of the project. Caldwell contacted William Withrow, the director of the Art Gallery of Ontario, at the time requesting the possibility of having lecturers from his staff visit, make publications available, and give any advice he might offer to assist with the gallery's development. However, the answer Caldwell received from Withrow was very negative. Withrow would not support the gallery until it should reconsider its objectives and become a bona fide community gallery. This was the incentive for the founding members to create a public gallery. When Caldwell approached Milton Carman, the Executive Director of the Council for the Arts for the Province of Ontario, for advice and support, he was told, We understand you're starting an art gallery. Before you may approach us, you must have a charter, bylaws, board of trustees and a qualified director. Even the City of Oshawa was somewhat apprehensive about the establishment of the gallery. 
From another quarter came rumor the council of the city of Oshawa was much concerned and alarmed that in the very heart of the city there might be displayed images of nudity, pornography, and solicity. However, amongst all this negativity there was a spark of hope. Caldwell learned of Alexandra Luke's dedication to art. He met with her while she was a patient of the Oshawa General Hospital. This alert, quiet-spoken lady with grace, interest, and enthusiasm discussed in the short time permitted the invaluable benefit this gallery would represent in the years to come to Oshawa's growth and maturation. Alexandra Luke then presented Caldwell with a $100 check to be used toward building costs. It is important to take a moment to discuss the important influence Alexandra Luke had on the establishment of the gallery and to briefly examine her life as an artist since the gallery embodies much of her philosophy about Canadian and world art. She was married to Ewart McLaughlin, the grandson to Robert McLaughlin, and she was also a somewhat well-known artist. In 1952, she organized the first Canadian all-abstract show, the Canadian Abstract Exhibition, which traveled throughout Canada. Through the show, she met the painters, who were later to become members of the Painters' Eleven. The official meeting of the group took place at Luke's Cottage Studio in Whitby. The group was formed as a deliberate attempt by Luke and ten others, most of them half her age, to fight their way into the sunlight, to have their own shows, get into other shows, sell more paintings. In her cultural historical time trap, Luke never gave up the battle for her own work and that of painters like her. Luke wanted to support her fellow members. She herself never sold much, but she was pleased when she did. She began to buy the work of her friends in their exhibitions together. These paintings later formed the core of our gallery's collection. Luke died of cancer in 1967, soon after plans for the Art Gallery of Oshawa were announced. The plans pleased her greatly. She told the gallery's first director, Bill Caldwell, she wished she were 20 years younger and could put her shoulder to the wheel too. The development by the Board of a Commitment to Contemporary Canadian Art justified her in a life so courageously lived. More financial support came from Richard Dick McLaughlin, the son of Ewart McLaughlin, Alexander Luke's husband, who presented Caldwell with a cheque from his father to be also used toward building costs. Dick McLaughlin remarked that it had been his father's intention to someday donate such a structure to the city of Oshawa, but had yet to do so. This gallery's creation preempted that intent. Dick McLaughlin also asked in his father's name if the title of the gallery might be changed to the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, in memory of his grandfather. Without hesitation, this was assured. The executive of the Oshawa Art Gallery carefully crafted what would be known today as a mission statement for the gallery, the purpose being to encapsulate the need for establishing a gallery. And at this point, a building site needed to be acquired. It was decided that although within the floodplain, a simple engineering challenge, the area in the green belt immediately west of the library was eminently suitable and complemented the civic center that was under construction at the time. This property was owned by the city. Mr. Ewart McLaughlin fully agreed with this location and asked Mayor Marks if the city of Oshawa would make this available. Mr. Marks assured all that Oshawa would be pleased to donate this property as the gallery's new home. Now that a site for the gallery had been secured and construction started, the search was on for a permanent director. It was felt that someone with professional experience in art gallery management and a background in fine art would give the gallery a more legitimate standing within the art community and would more readily facilitate financial support from various government bodies. After reviewing a number of qualified applicants, the committee recommended and the board accepted Jeremy Watney as the first permanent director of the gallery and on June 19, 1969, the new gallery was officially opened. Now that a physical building had been erected, the gallery next set out to acquire as many of the painter's 11 works that were available for the permanent collections, since this was an important local group of painters founded by Alexandra Luke. Alexandra Luke had started the collection by donating several pieces from her own collection. All the living members of the Painters 11 were contacted and most of them were very enthusiastic about donating or selling some of their works to the gallery. These acquisitions and several other pieces from other donors as well as several purchases started the permanent collection. In the latter part of 1969, Jeremy Watney resigned his position as director and was replaced by Paul Bennett. 
Watney brought a professional tone to the gallery and helped to establish it as a legitimate institution within the art community. Paul Bennett extended the character of the gallery by making strong connections with local, national, and international artists and art institutions. Bennett was replaced by Glenn E. Cummings on July 1, 1972, who, in turn, was succeeded by Joan Murray on January 1, 1974. It was the strong leadership and vision of each of these directors that strengthened the reputation of the gallery as one of importance at both the provincial and the national level. Under their leadership, the gallery collection enjoyed steady growth to the point where today the permanent collection consists of well over 4,500 works of art. Through the 1970s and into the 1980s, the gallery bought and had donated many valuable works of art. Every month saw the acquisition of many fine pieces, so much so that the existing display, storage and office space was becoming too cramped to accommodate the needs of a gallery that was quickly becoming recognized at both the provincial and national levels. The need for expansion became a progressively important topic of discussion at gallery board meetings. On May 10, 1979, May Nurse, the wife of Bill Nurse, owner of a local GM dealership in Whitby, as well as a major supporter of the gallery, called to order one of the first meetings of the building committee. She explained that the purpose of the committee was to examine the needs of the gallery and what could be done to help the crowded vault conditions, the lack of space for creating and storage, and the crowded conditions of the library, slide library, art rental, and offices. The initial ideas from this meeting eventually resulted in the expansion of the gallery, but it was not until 1987 that the newly expanded gallery officially opened to the public. Along the way, there were many trials and tribulations that had to be overcome. There were several levels of government that needed to be consulted and have their approval authorized. There were several environmental concerns that needed to be addressed. Architectural considerations needed to be carefully reviewed, altered and approved and of course funds to cover the costs needed to be acquired. One of the major donors to the expansion fund was, not surprisingly, Isabel McLaughlin. Since the inception of the original gallery, Isabel McLaughlin had always been a major supporter financially of the gallery. She also gave many major pieces of Canadian art from her own collection to the gallery. As part of the addition, there would be space for a permanent collection of Canadian art which belongs to Isabel McLaughlin and which she is donating to the gallery. This collection presents a cross-section of Canadian art and would help bridge the gap to more modern expression according to the director. The importance of Isabel McLaughlin's support of the expansion is best summarized by Joan Murray in An Extraordinary Life, Isabel McLaughlin, 2003. In 1984, in preparation for a new building for the gallery by Arthur Erickson, Ms. McLaughlin made a donation that sparked the building campaign that provided exhibition and storage space appropriate to the scale of our fast developing collection. A second donation followed to allow a more major expansion program than initially planned. In 1987 she gifted to the gallery works from her collection. A second gift followed in 1990 with works by the group of seven and First Nation artists and from then on she continued to give art to the collection as well as gifting books to the library. These collections serve as a vibrant reminder of her intelligence, intuition and enthusiasm. Bill Nurse and his wife May Nurse were instrumental in leading the building committee through the various pains of planning and fundraising for the expansion. The cost was steadily rising at this time but Bill and May along with many other committee members were able to steer fundraising campaigns and grant writing projects to acquire the necessary funds for the project. Although there were many obstacles to overcome over the years before the sod turning ceremony on September 24, 1985, the official opening finally took place on December 5, 1987. The expansion program report published in the annual report for 1985 states, on September 24, the Robert McLaughlin Gallery welcomed visitors and friends to the sod turning for the expansion of the gallery. During the previous 14 months, much planning, research and fundraising has been carried out by the building committee. All of this effort culminated in January with the awarding of a four million dollar contract to Gay Construction Limited for the construction of the gallery's extension. Among the amenities which will be provided to Durham residents are a fully glazed 55 seat restaurant overlooking City Hall and a meeting room for community groups. In addition to two new galleries and a gift shop, the main floor will contain a large skylit lobby suitable for exhibition openings and other cultural events. 
The new structure will be fully accessible to the handicapped through ramps and an elevator. The lower floor contains an education facility with two studio classrooms and a library. Eventually, the new Robert McLaughlin Gallery will have some 36,000 square feet in gallery space. In order to honor two of the principal donors and supporters of the gallery since its inception, the opening show consisted of a tribute to the work of Alexandra Luke and Isabel McLaughlin. The launch of the new building also saw a group of exhibitions entitled Founding Facts that focused on the circumstances surrounding the gallery's beginnings. The opening also saw an exhibition of our rich collection of Painters 11, as well as a selection from Thomas Buckley's 4,000 historical photographs of Oshawa and District, recently given to the gallery. The world of William Kerlick was also part of the opening schedule. According to the President's Report published in the Annual Report 1987, the opening was a tribute to contributions, financial or otherwise, by all persons of every capacity to the reactivation of our gallery. The new and larger facilities have dramatically expanded the scope of our gallery. For example, the gallery library now houses a small but valuable selection of art books, the community galleries on the first floor have provided a large workshop area and professional gallery display area, the main floor galleries have increased our capacity to exhibit by at least threefold and thereby have permitted substantial exhibitions at any one time. The 2000 works in our main collection have on-site vault storage with vault housing that costs in excess of $1 million. The built-in climatic control will permit our gallery to be a forerunner in acquiring works of art for proper preservation and conservation in the future. Further in the President's report, Joan Murray's contribution was formalized. Joan Murray's vision of our gallery as a prime contributor to art display and education in the national community has resulted in overwhelming public interest in our gallery and attendance at the new gallery has been beyond expectation. Also, the President's report recognizes the support of the City of Oshawa. The Corporation of the City of Oshawa has supported the gallery financially to the fullest and given the gallery the strong presence that it deserves as a major contributor to our community and national cultural life. Thus, one man's stumble resulted in the creation of a world-class art gallery that preserves the heritage of Canadian art while making significant local, national and international works of art approachable for all. The Robert McLaughlin Gallery, while staying true to the vision of its original founders, has expanded its mandate to make art accessible to all and to preserve the culture and fibre of Canadian society as embedded within its art. The future is bright for our gallery. Look at what has been achieved in the last 50 years. One can only imagine what the next 50 will bring.